everyone. Full room. I can really feel the anticipation in the air as the Slush 100 pitching competition gets uh, closer to its end. Um, now it's time for the final stage talk uh, of this Slush, so some last minute advice for all the founders in the audience by Ilkka. Thanks for so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's start with the importance of mentoring and advice for startups and how all that actually comes together here at Slush. So, so what's, your what's your take? Like, why are you and all of our other speakers actually here? What makes you to take the time to do this? Well, um, personally, I, I just, you know, I get so, so much out of this, you know. Um, we like a few days at Slush, they are all basically the highlight of, of my year. You know, it's almost like this kind of escape or kind of a bubble of its own. And, you know, it's filled with like optimism and positivity and, you know, uh, crazy dreams and energy and all of those things that I, that I love. So I just, you know, and always like when I can step out from this bubble uh, next week, I know that I'm going to be full of new ideas and just, you know, inspiration. Yeah, so same for you as an experienced founder, as for many of the early stage founders here. Um, I'd be curious to know, what would you say to those that are maybe too shy or maybe too Finnish uh, to approach experienced founders like yourself for advice? And actually, who are the best people to give advice for early founders? Well, um, I guess my advice about getting advice would be actually quite simple. Is that, and that would be that, um, you know, listen to everybody, but be sure to decide yourself. And I, I think one of the most dangerous things to do, actually, is to blindly follow the advice from, say, quote-unquote, successful people. And the reason is that, um, you know, um, uh, you know, at least I can speak for my, myself, is that, you know, I mean, obviously I've worked very hard together, you know, all, with all of our people and the team, but the fact is that we've been also incredibly, incredibly lucky. And, you know, um, if I give advice, you know, I think that piece of advice is only applicable to, to things that we've done, and, and, but maybe but maybe it's not like because of the stuff that we did that we became successful. I mean, luck clearly also has played a big role. So therefore, you know, it's, it's, it gets really, really dangerous if you can blindly follow like advice from other people who've been like been, you know, successful and, and of course they have strong opinions. But maybe, maybe that advice is only applicable to their own situation, and maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's just because they simply got lucky. So uh, again, you know, listen to everybody, but do decide yourself. Nobody knows your business better than what you do. Yeah, that is definitely true. Um, so you clearly talk with many founders uh, uh, like through, throughout your career. And uh, what do you think? What is the number one thing that you see founders struggle with again and again? Well, I, I my, uh, sort of how I think about it is that, and what I see like happen quite often is that, uh, you know, people oftentimes they kind of found companies like together with their friends. And, and I, I think my, I would actually advise against that. And, and I think it's, it's dangerous because, you know, if you think about the kind of your friends, I mean, oftentimes you are friends with those people because you, of course you like them and you like them because you're kind of like-minded and you sort of agree on things often. But, but that's usually, at least in my mind, that's almost the opposite what makes a great team. Because in my experience, what makes a great team is that you, you have a, like a very diverse set of people with different personalities, different points of view, which of course means that when you're trying to reach a decision, like oftentimes those different points of view, view are in conflict in each other and there's like even tension and even like heated arguments oftentimes. But the fact that, you know, you have that then um, it means that, you know, all the information is sort of on the table and therefore when you have all the information, then you can actually uh, make ultimately the best decision. So in, in my mind, like what's kind of common, about, the common denominator about the best teams is, is that despite these differences in the team members and despite these differences in perspectives, then they, they can have a like a kind of a rational discussion and at the end of the discussion, they will agree on a common goal and then sort of like, and at, at the point then the, the 
they agree on that common goal, then the sort of a discussion stops and then the execution begins and then everybody aligns like behind that goal. But it's that kind of diversity of kind of perspectives that is important and oftentimes if you do found companies with your best friends, you know, you just don't have that by definition. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, how about then you yourself? What do you think has been the biggest mistake you've made uh, in your founding journey? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, talking about mistakes, I don't know where to where to begin. I mean, uh, you know, I've made mis I, I make mistakes all the, all the time. But maybe like uh, uh, thinking about this, like um, maybe the more more recent mistakes that I've done is, and they all, you know. Um, they have they have something to do with this thing that obviously like as i said we've been lucky and uh, and you know we've been uh, very successful uh, and and I, i think you know like we the more successful you've been in in the past you know the harder it sort of gets to be to kind of repeat that success and at least in our industry in games that that to me actually is, is the, the ultimate thing that it's the thing is not to be successful the, the thing is to like try to somehow continue to be successful and repeat it and to get even better but it becomes surprisingly hard like when you've had that past success and oftentimes you sort of uh, try, start to view things like through the lens of your past successes rather than like looking forward and having that open mind and and uh, and you know I've certainly been a victim of you know kind of a of of that and and uh, and it, it requires like your constant attention trying to like you know have that open mind and, and and you know forget about the past and focus on the future yeah makes a lot of sense well we are currently here in the middle of the slash 100 pitching competition uh, and uh, one company will come out as a winner however there has been 99 excellent founders excellent startups joining the company uh, what would you what advice would you give to those the ones who don't end up as a winner uh, well I would tell them that it, do, it doesn't matter. Um, no, I think the thing about these competitions uh, is that uh, it really isn't about the outcome. It's about the process and about everything that you learn uh, when you kind of go through that process. So, to those 99 companies who don't walk away with a prize, uh, you know, I. I'm sure that they've gotten a lot of value, you know, from from this competition. You know, they've, you know, gotten a lot of feedback. Hopefully, they've made a lot of connections, and all of those are like incredibly valuable. So, you know, even if you didn't, you know, win the grand prize, I mean, you 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 will come out of like you know better, and you know, let's just you know go do you know, um, what you were doing and, and you know, and, and be equipped with all of this new information and, and, and be better and be focused on a customer, focused on a product, you know, do the usual thing. Yeah, so the competition is just like a one step in the journey, uh, but the long journey matters more. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like from, from my own experience, I mean, we've, uh, you know, before Supercell became successful, I don't think we won any competitions. Uh, and, and, you know, like, I mean, and again, 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 like, you know, it's a, at this, all of these guys are at a very early stage. It's incredibly hard to, you know, predict who's going to be successful and who's not. And I say that, that we've, all, we've all respect to the judges and, and the panels, but it's just hard, hard to predict successes. And, and I, in my own, experience like actually the uh, the outlier successes the, the biggest successes like what's kind of common about those is that none of those were obvious like from a start none of those were obvious at this stage that these companies are in yeah that is definitely true how about then the one company that will come out as a winner a top tip for them well of course you know um I'm sure like today, you know, enjoy the moment. It's it's time to celebrate. I'm sure, you know, that company and all, all of us, all of us companies have, of course, worked very hard. So, you know, take this day and moment and, and, and enjoy it. But then tomorrow, get back to work, you know, get super laser focused on your product, get focused on your customers and, you know, solving the problems of your customers and, and, and that type of thing. And again, it's, as, as I said, you know, it's, you know, it's not about these past successes and, and, and stuff like that. It's about the future. And uh, at least I, you know, and, and again, even at, at Supercell, like, I mean, since we became successful, then all of a sudden we magically start to win all kinds of awards. But I've actually felt that, uh, you know, those awards, like we probably even shouldn't have those at the office actually because I mean it's they just don't matter I mean mm -hmm. the past doesn't matter at all I and mean, you shouldn't really like think about it too much you should be focused on the future yeah past doesn't define the future 
Um, yes, then maybe briefly about what founders can take away from Slush. So uh, there has been 20,000 pre-booked meetings happening, a lot of side events, uh, connections created. Um, but this is just sort of a starting point. What advice would you give for founders for utilizing all the connections that they made here at Slush? Well, um, uh, it, it's not rocket science. I mean, you you, you follow up and, and you know you you stay in touch with with people and you also focus. I mean, you know, figure out like who are the most valuable connections and then focus on those and rather than like you know. Um, trying to like you know uh, i mean obviously you meet tens and tens and tens if not hundreds of people so you can't obviously like develop deep relationships with all of those people so you figure out who likely are going to be most valuable and then and focus on them yeah makes a lot of sense um Something that I guess many of us are waiting eagerly is the legendary slush after party that will kick off uh, straight after the main event ends uh, actually quite soon. Um, so would you have any fun after party anecdotes or networking tips for our early stage founders? Uh, well, I, I don't think you want to listen networking tips from me. I'm, I, I suck at networking, <laughs> uh, but... Um, Anecdote. So, well, I, there's this one funny story that actually co does come to mind. Uh, I believe it's from the Slush uh, 2012, maybe, uh, when it was still at the, the old uh, cable factory, uh, and um, and for some reason the, the, the Slush after party like ran out of drinks, and then uh, and that happened to be that party happened to be uh, sponsored by by Supercell at the time, and there was a big alert like, oh my God, like we are running out of. Uh, Drinks, and of course, uh, it's, it's a big, big problem. And uh, and Supercell at the time was still a pretty tiny company, like maybe I don't know, 50 plus employees or so. And what they did is that they mobilized, mobilized like basically the, the employees and, and Superselians that they had at the party, and and you know asked them to like you know like buy whatever you can like from the kind of grocery stores near, nearby. But then the problem was that we, I think, because we have a really had and still have a very kind of strict uh, chief finance officer so who had given like credit cards only to very few people so maybe we had like five or six credit cards and you know people were running around around Helsinki and you know trying trying to buy whatever they, they could to serve us first the uh, slush after party so that comes to mind yeah fun memory oh, sorry really fun memory um, yes maybe as a final question I'd like to hear, like, you've seen many slushes. I believe that you actually participated the very first one in 2008. Um, what has changed and what has stayed similar? Um, well, it's easier to start like what has stayed the same, and that's clear with weather. Uh, it's, it's, it is actually like today, I think it's almost exactly how it was in, in 2008. Maybe a slightly less slushy and more cold, but uh, pretty much the same. But, but then I think everything else is like different, like, like very, very different. I, I feel that in 2008, when Slush started, it was, pretty, uh, it, it was a lot about like putting the, uh, the Finnish entrepreneurship on the tech entrepreneurship on the map. And, and then like, you know, uh, um, over the years it has evolved and, and especially like, you know, when Mickey took over, it uh, evolved it to be, into this kind of celebration of entrepreneurship in its own and European entrepreneurship and just became a, a, a bigger thing. So that's, that's clear is, is, is very, very different. Yeah, I definitely share the feeling. Like for me as well, Slush is about escaping your everyday life and just like celebrating entrepreneurship and enjoying the company of like-minded people. Thank you so much, for Ilka, for joining us today, and uh, can't wait to see the results of this Lush 100 startup competition. Thank you very much. <clears throat>